Section four of the Aeneid of Virgil. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book two, part two. But ah, what use of valor can be made when heaven's propitious powers refuse their aid? Behold the royal prophetess, the fair Cassandra, dragged by her dishevelled hair, whom not Minerva's shrine nor sacred bands in safety could protect from sacrilegious hands. On heaven she cast her eyes, she sighed, she cried, twas all she could, her tender arms were tied. So sad a sight Coribus could not bear, but fired with rage, distracted with despair, amid the barbarous ravishers he flew, our leader's rash example we pursue. But storms of stones from the proud temple's height pour down and on our battered helms alight. We from our friends received this fatal blow, who thought us Grecians, as we seemed in show. They aim at the mistaken crests from high, and ours beneath the ponderous ruin lie. Then, moved with anger and disdain to see their troops dispersed, the royal virgin free, the Grecians rally and their powers unite, with fury charge us and renew the fight. The brother kings with Ajax join their force, and the whole squadron of Thessalian horse. Thus, when the rival winds their quarrel try, contending for the kingdom of the sky, south, east, and west, on airy courses borne, the whirlwind gathers, and the woods are torn. Then Nereus strikes the deep, the billows rise, and mixed with ooze and sand pollute the skies. The troops we squandered first again appear from several quarters and enclose the rear. They first observe, and to the rest betray, our different speech, our borrowed arms survey. Oppressed with odds we fall, Coribus first, at palace altar by Peneleus pierced. Then Repheus followed in the unequal fight, just of his word, observant of the right. Heaven thought not so, Demos their fate attends, with Hippanis mistaken by their friends. Nor Pantheus, thee, thy mitre, nor the bands of awful Phoebus, save from impious hands. Ye Trojan flames, your testimony bear, what I performed, and what I suffered there. No sword avoiding in the fatal strife, exposed to death and prodigal of life. Witness, ye heavens, I live not by my fault, I strove to have deserved the death I sought. But when I could not fight, and would have died, borne off to distance by the growing tide, Old Iphitus and I were hurried thence, with Peleus wounded and without defence. New clamours from the invested palace ring, we run to die or disengage the king. So hot the assault, so high the tumult rose, whilst ours defend, and while the Greeks oppose, as all the Dardan and Argolic race had been contracted in that narrow space. Or as all Ilium else were void of fear, and tumult, war, and slaughter only there, their targets in a tortoise cast, the foes, secure advancing to the turrets rose. Some mount the scaling ladders, some more bold swerve upwards, and by posts and pillars hold. Their left hand grips their bucklers in the ascent, while with their right they seize the battlement. From their demolished towers the Trojans throw huge heaps of stones that falling crush the foe. And heavy beams and rafters from the sides, such arms their last necessity provides and gilded roofs come tumbling from on high the marks of state and ancient royalty. The guards below, fixed in the pass, attend the charge undaunted and the gate defend. Renewed in courage with recovered breath, a second time we ran to tempt our death, to clear the palace from the foe, succeed the weary living, and revenge the dead. A postern door, yet unobserved and free, joined by the length of a blind gallery, to the king's closet led, a way well known to Hector's wife while Priam held the throne, through which she brought Astyanax unseen to cheer his grandsire and his grandsire's queen. Through this we pass and mount the tower, from whence with unavailing arms the Trojans make defence. From this the trembling king had oft descried the Grecian camp and saw their navy ride. Beams from its lofty height with swords we hew, then wrenching with our hands the assault renew and where the rafters on the columns meet we push them headlong with our arms and feet the lightning flies not swifter than the fall nor thunder louder than the ruined wall down goes the top at once the greeks beneath are piecemeal torn are pounded into death yet more succeed and more to death are sent 
we cease not from above nor they below relent before the gate stood pyrrhus threatening loud with glittering arms conspicuous in the crowd so shines renewed in youth the crested snake who slept the winter in a thorny brake and casting off his slough when spring returns now looks aloft and with new glory burns restored with poisonous herbs his ardent sides reflect the sun and raised on spires he rides high o'er the grass hissing he rolls along and brandishes by fits his forky tongue proud periphas and fierce automedon his father's charioteer together run to force the gate the syrian infantry rush on in crowds and the barred passage free entering the court with shouts the skies they rend and flaming firebrands to the roofs ascend himself among the foremost deals his blows and with his axe repeated strokes bestows on the strong doors then all their shoulders ply till from the posts the brazen hinges fly he hews apace the double bars at length yield to his axe and unresisted strength a mighty breach is made the rooms concealed appear and all the palaces revealed the halls of audience and of public state and where the lonely queen in secret set armed soldiers now by trembling maids are seen with not a door and scarce a space between the house is filled with loud laments and cries and shrieks of women rend the vaulted skies the fearful matrons run from place to place and kiss the thresholds and the posts embrace the fatal work inhuman pyrrhus plies and all his father sparkles in his eyes nor bars nor fighting guards his force sustain the bars are broken and the guards are slain in rush the greeks and all the apartments fill those few defendants whom they find they kill not with so fierce a rage the foaming flood roars when he finds his rapid course withstood bears down the dams with unresisted sway and sweeps the cattle and the cots away these eyes beheld him when he marched between the brother kings i saw the unhappy queen the hundred wives and where old priam stood to stain his hallowed altar with his brood the fifty nuptial beds such hopes had he so large a promise of a prodigy the posts of plated gold and hung with spoils fell the reward of the proud victor's toils where e'er the raging fire had left a space the grecians enter and possess the place perhaps you may of priam's fate inquire he when he saw his regal town on fire his ruined palace and his entering foes on every side inevitable woes in arms disused invests his limbs decayed like them with age a late and useless aid his feeble shoulders scarce the weight sustain loaded not armed he creeps along with pain despairing of success ambitious to be slain uncovered but by heaven there stood in view an altar near the hearth a laurel grew daughtered with age whose boughs encompass round the household gods and shade the holy ground here hecuba with all her helpless train of dames for shelter sought but sought in vain driven like a flock of doves along the sky their images they hug and to their altars fly the queen when she beheld her trembling lord and hanging by his side a heavy sword what rage she cried has seized my husband's mind what arms are these and to what use designed these times want other aids were hector here even hector now in vain like priam would appear with us one common shelter thou shalt find or in one common fate with us be joined she said and with a last salute embraced the poor old man and by the laurel placed behold politis one of priam's sons pursued by pyrrhus there for safety runs through swords and foes amazed and hurt he flies through empty courts and open galleries him pyrrhus urging with his lance pursues and often reaches and his thrusts renews the youth transfixed with lamentable cries expires before his wretched parents eyes whom gasping at his feet when priam saw the fear of death gave place to nature's law and shaking more with anger than with age the gods said he requite thy brutal rage as sure they will barbarian sure they must if there be gods in heaven and gods be just who takest in wrongs an insolent delight with a son's death to infect a father's sight 
not he whom thou and lying fame conspire to call thee his not he thy vaunted sire thus used my wretched age the gods he feared the laws of nature and of nations heard he cheered my sorrows and for sums of gold the bloodless carcass of my hector sold pitied the woes a parent underwent and sent me back in safety from his tent this said his feeble hand a javelin threw which fluttering seemed to loiter as it flew just and but barely to the mark it held and faintly tinkled on the brazen shield then pyrrhus said go thou from me to fate and to my father my foul deeds relate now die with that he dragged the trembling sire slittering through clottered blood and holy mire the mingled paste his murdered son had made hold from beneath the violated shade and on the sacred pile the royal victim laid his right hand held his bloody falchion bare his left he twisted in his hoary hair then with a speeding thrust his heart he found the lukewarm blood came rushing through the wound and sanguine streams disdained the sacred ground thus priam fell and shared one common fate with troy and ashes and his ruined state he who the sceptre of all asia swayed whom monarchs like domestic slaves obeyed on the bleak shore now lies the abandoned king a headless carcass and a nameless thing then not before i felt my cruddled blood congeal with fear my hair with horror stood my father's image filled my pious mind lest equal years might equal fortune find again i thought on my forsaken wife and trembled for my son's abandoned life i looked about but found myself alone deserted at my need my friends were gone some spent with toil some with despair oppressed leaped headlong from the heights the flames consumed the rest thus wandering in my way without a guide the graceless helen in the porch i spied of vesta's temple there she lurked alone muffled she sat and what she could unknown but by the flames that cast their blaze around that common bane of greece and troy i found for ilium burnt she dreads the trojan sword more dreads the vengeance of her injured lord even by those gods who refuged her abhorred trembling with rage the strumpet i regard resolved to give her guilt the due reward shall she triumphant sail before the wind and leave in flames unhappy troy behind shall she her kingdom and her friends review in state attended with a captive crew while unrevenged the good old priam falls and grecian fires consume the trojan walls for this the phrygian fields and xanthian flood were swelled with bodies and were drunk with blood tis true a soldier can small honour gain and boast no conquest from a woman slain yet shall the fact not pass without applause of vengeance taken in so just a cause the punished crime shall set my soul at ease and murmuring manes of my friends appease thus while i rave a gleam of pleasing light spread o'er the place and shining heavenly bright my mother stood revealed before my sight never so radiant did her eyes appear not her own star confessed a light so clear great in her charms as when on gods above she looks and breathes herself into their love she held my hand the destined blow to break then from her rosy lips began to speak my son from whence this madness this neglect of my commands and those whom i protect why this unmanly rage recall to mind whom you forsake what pledges leave behind look if your helpless father yet survive or if ascanius or crusa live around your house the greedy grecians err and these had perished in the nightly war but for my presence and protecting care not helen's face nor paris was in fault but by the gods was this destruction brought now cast your eyes around while i dissolve the mists and films that mortal eyes involve purge from your sight the dross and make you see the shape of each avenging deity enlightened thus my just commands fulfil nor fear obedience to your mother's will where yon disordered heap of ruin lies stones rent from stones where clouds of dust arise 
amid that smother neptune holds his place below the wall's foundation drives his mace and heaves the building from the solid base look where in arms imperial juno stands full in the sky and gate with loud commands urging on shore the tardy grecian bands see pallas of her snaky buckler proud bestrides the tower refulgent through the cloud see jove new courage to the foe supplies and arms against the town the partial deities haste hence my son this fruitless labor end haste where your trembling spouse and sire attend haste and a mother's care your passage shall befriend she said and swiftly vanished from my sight obscure in clouds and gloomy shades of night i looked i listened dreadful sounds i hear and the dire forms of hostile gods appear troy sunk in flames i saw nor could prevent and ilium from its old foundations rent rent like a mountain ash which dared the winds and stood the sturdy strokes of laboring hinds about the roots the cruel axe resounds the stumps are pierced with oft-repeated wounds the war is felt on high the nodding crown now threats a fall and throws the leafy honours down to their united force it yields though late and mourns with mortal groans the approaching fate the roots no more their upper load sustain but down she falls and spreads a ruin through the plain descending thence i scape through foes and fire before the goddess foes and flames retire arrived at home he for whose only sake or most for his such toils i undertake the good anchises whom by timely flight i purposed to secure on ida's height refused the journey resolute to die and add his funerals to the fate of troy rather than exile and old age sustain go you whose blood runs warm in every vein had heaven decreed that i should life enjoy heaven had decreed to save unhappy troy tis sure enough if not too much for one twice to have seen our ilium overthrown make haste to save the poor remaining crew and give this useless corpse a long adieu these weak old hands suffice to stop my breath at least the pitying foes will aid my death to take my spoils and leave my body bare as for my sepulchre let heaven take care tis long since i for my celestial wife loathed by the gods have dragged a lingering life since every hour and moment i expire blasted from heaven by jove's avenging fire this oft repeated he stood fixed to die myself my wife my son my family entreat pray beg and raise a doleful cry what will he still persist on death resolve and in his ruin all his house involve he still persists his reasons to maintain our prayers our tears our loud laments are vain urged by despair again i go to try the fate of arms resolved in fight to die what hope remains but what my death must give can i without so dear a father live you term it prudence what i baseness call could such a word from such a parent fall if fortune please and so the gods ordain that nothing should have ruined troy remain and you conspire with fortune to be slain the way to death is wide the approach is near for soon relentless pyrrhus will appear reeking with priam's blood the wretch who slew the son inhuman in the father's view and then the sire himself to the dire altar drew o goddess mother give me back to fate your gift was undesired and came too late did you for this unhappy me convey through foes and fires to see my house a prey shall i my father wife and son behold weltering in blood each other's arms enfold haste gird my sword though spent and overcome tis the last summons to receive our doom i hear thee fate and i obey thy call not unrevenged the foe shall see my fall restore me to the yet unfinished fight my death is wanting to conclude the night armed once again my glittering sword i wield while the other hand sustains my weighty shield 
and forth I rush to seek the abandoned field. I went, but sad Creusa stopped my way, and cross the threshold in my passage lay, embraced my knees, and when I would have gone, showed me my feeble sire and tender son. If death be your design, at least, said she, take us along to share your destiny. If any farther hopes in arms remain, this place, these pledges of your love maintain. To whom do you expose your father's life, your son's and mine, your now forgotten wife? While thus she fills the house with clamorous cries, our hearing is diverted by our eyes. For while I held my son in the short space betwixt our kisses and our last embrace, strange to relate, from young Eulus' head a lambent flame arose, which gently spread around his brows and on his temples fed. Amazed with running water we prepare to quench the sacred fire and slake his hair, but old Anchises, versed in omens, reared his hands to heaven, and this request preferred. If any vows, almighty Jove, can bend thy will, if piety can prayers commend, confirm the glad presage which thou art pleased to send. Scarce had he said, when on our left we hear a peal of rattling thunder roll in air. There shot a streaming lamp along the sky, which on the winged lightning seemed to fly. From o'er the roof the blaze began to move, and trailing vanished in the Edean grove. It swept a path in heaven and shone a guide, then in a steaming stench of sulphur died. The good old man with suppliant hands implored the gods' protection, and their star adored. Now, now, said he, my son, no more delay. I yield, I follow where heaven shows the way. Keep, O my country, gods, our dwelling place, and guard this relic of the Trojan race, this tender child. These omens are your own, and you can yet restore the ruined town. At least accomplish what your signs foreshow. I stand resigned, and am prepared to go. He said, The crackling flames appear on high, and driving sparkles dance along the sky. With Vulcan's rage the rising winds conspire, and near our palace roll the flood of fire. Haste, my dear father, tis no time to wait, and load my shoulders with a willing freight. Whate'er befalls, your life shall be my care. One death or one deliverance we will share. My hand shall lead our little son, and you, my faithful consort, shall our steps pursue. Next you, my servants, heed my strict commands. Without the walls a ruined temple stands, to Ceres hallowed once, a cypress nigh shoots up her venerable head on high, by long religion kept. There bend your feet, and in divided parties let us meet. Our country gods, the relics, and the bands, hold you, my father, in your guiltless hands. In me tis impious holy things to bear, red as I am with slaughter, new from war, till in some living stream I cleanse the guilt of dire debate, and blood and battle spilt. Thus, ordering all that prudence could provide, I clothe my shoulders with a lion's hide and yellow spoils, then on my bending back the welcome load of my dear father take, while on my better hand Ascanius hung, and with unequal paces tripped along. Crusa kept behind, by choice we stray through every dark and every devious way. I, who so bold and dauntless, just before the Grecian darts and shock of lances bore, at every shadow now am seized with fear, not for myself, but for the charge I bear. Till, near the ruined gate arrived at last, secure and deeming all the danger past, a frightful noise of trampling feet we hear. My father, looking through the shades with fear, cried out, Haste, haste, my son, the foes are nigh, their swords and shining armor I descry. Some hostile god, for some unknown offense, had sure bereft my mind of better sense. For while through winding ways I took my flight, and sought the shelter of the gloomy night, alas, I lost Crusa, hard to tell, if by her fatal destiny she fell, or weary sate, or wandered with affright. But she was lost for ever to my sight. I knew not, or reflected, till I meet my friends at Ceres' now deserted seat. We met, not one was wanting, only she, deceived her friends, her son, and wretched me. What mad expressions did my tongue refuse? 
Whom did I not of gods or men accuse? This was the fatal blow that pained me more than all I felt from ruined Troy before. Stung with my loss and raving with despair, abandoning my now forgotten care, of counsel, comfort, and of hope bereft, my sire, my son, my country gods I left. In shining armor once again I sheathe my limbs, not feeling wounds nor fearing death. Then headlong to the burning walls I run, and seek the danger I was forced to shun. I tread my former tracks through night, explore each passage, every street I crossed before. All things were full of horror and affright, and dreadful even the silence of the night. Then to my father's house I make repair, with some small glimpse of hope to find her there. Instead of her, the cruel Greeks I meet. The house was filled with foes, with flames beset, driven on the wings of winds, whole sheets of fire through air transported to the roofs aspire. From thence to Priam's palace I resort, and search the citadel and desert court. Then, unobserved, I pass by Juno's church, a guard of Grecians had possessed the porch. There Phoenix and Ulysses watch prey, and thither all the wealth of Troy convey. The spoils which they from ransacked houses brought, and golden bowls from burning altars caught, the tables of the gods, the purple vests, the people's treasure and the pomp of priests, a rank of wretched youths with pinioned hands, and captive matrons in long order stands. Then with ungoverned madness I proclaim through all the silent street Crusa's name, Crusa still I call, at length she hears, and sudden through the shades of night appears, appears no more Crusa nor my wife, but a pale spectre larger than the life. Aghast, astonished, and struck dumb with fear, I stood like bristles rose my stiffened hair. Then thus the ghost began to soothe my grief, nor tears nor cries can give the dead relief. Desist, my much-loved lord, to indulge your pain, you bear no more than what the gods ordain. My fates permit me not from hence to fly, nor he the great controller of the sky. Long wandering ways for you the powers decree, on land hard labors and a length of sea. Then after many painful years are past, on Latium's happy shore you shall be cast, where gentle Tiber from his bed beholds the flowery meadows and the feeding folds. There end your toils, and there your fates provide a quiet kingdom and a royal bride. Their fortune shall the Trojan line restore, and you for lost Crusa weep no more. Fear not that I shall watch with servile shame the imperious looks of some proud Grecian dame, or stooping to the victor's lust disgrace my goddess mother or my royal race. And now farewell. The parent of the gods restrains my fleeting soul in her abodes. I trust our common issue to your care. She said, and gliding past unseen in air. I strove to speak, but horror tied my tongue, and thrice about her neck my arms I flung, and thrice deceived on vain embraces hung, light as an empty dream at break of day, or as a blast of wind she rushed away. Thus, having passed the night in fruitless pain, I to my longing friends return again, Amazed the augmented number to behold Of men and matrons mixed, of young and old, A wretched, exiled crew together brought, With arms appointed and with treasure fraught, Resolved and willing, under my command, To run all hazards both of sea and land. The morn began from Ida to display her rosy cheeks, And Phosphor led the day. Before the gates the Grecians took their post, and all pretense of late relief was lost. I yield to fate, unwillingly retire, and, loaded, up the hill convey my sire. End of section 4section five of the Aeneid of Virgil. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Aeneid of Virgil Translated by John Dryden Book Three, Part One When heaven had overturned the Trojan state, 
and Priam's throne by too severe a fate, when ruined Troy became the Grecian's prey, and Ilium's lofty towers and ashes lay. Warned by celestial omens, we retreat to seek in foreign lands a happier seat. Near old Antandros and at Ida's foot, the timber of the sacred groves we cut and build our fleet, uncertain yet to find what place the gods for our repose assigned. Friends daily flock, and scarce the kindly spring began to clothe the ground and birds to sing, when old Anchises summoned all to see, the crew my father and the fates obey. With sighs and tears I leave my native shore, and empty fields where Ilium stood before. My sire, my son, our less and greater gods, all sail at once, and cleave the briny floods. Against our coast appears a spacious land, which once the fierce Lycurgus did command. Thracia the name, the people bold in war, vast are their fields, and tillage is their care. A hospitable realm, while fate was kind, with Troy in friendship and religion joined. I land, with luckless omens, then adore their gods, and draw a line along the shore. I lay the deep foundations of a wall, and Enos named from me the city call. To Dionian Venus vows are paid, and all the powers that rising labors aid. A bull on Jove's imperial altar laid. Not far a rising hillock stood in view, sharp myrtles on the sides and cornels grew. There, while I went to crop the sylvan scenes, and shade our altar with their leafy greens, I pulled a plant, with horror I relate, a prodigy so strange and full of fate. The rooted fibres rose, and from the wound black bloody drops distilled upon the ground. Mute and amazed my hair with terror stood, fear shrunk my sinews and congealed my blood. Manned once again another plant I try, that other gushed with the same sanguine dye. Then, fearing guilt for some offence unknown, with prayers and vows the dryads I atone, with all the sisters of the woods, and most the god of arms who rules the Thracian coast, that they or he these omens would avert, release our fears, and better signs impart. Cleared, as I thought, and fully fixed at length to learn the cause, I tugged with all my strength, I bent my knees against the ground, once more the violated myrtle ran with gore. Scarce dare I tell the sequel. From the womb of wounded earth and caverns of the tomb, a groan as of a troubled ghost renewed my fright, and then these dreadful words ensued. Why dost thou thus my buried body rend? O oh, spare the corpse of thy unhappy friend! Spare to pollute thy pious hands with blood, the tears distill not from the wounded wood. But every drop this living tree contains is kindred blood, and ran in Trojan veins. O oh, fly from this unhospitable shore, warned by my fate, for I am Polydor. Here loads of lances in my blood imbrued, again shoot upward by my blood renewed. My faltering tongue and shivering limbs declare my horror, and in bristles rose my hair. When Troy with Grecian arms was closely pent, old Priam, fearful of the war's event, this hapless Polydor to Thracia sent. Loaded with gold, he sent his darling, far from noise and tumults and destructive war, committed to the faithless tyrant's care, who, when he saw the power of Troy decline, forsook the weaker with the strong to join, broke every bond of nature and of truth, and murdered for his wealth the royal youth. O oh, sacred hunger of pernicious gold! What bands of faith can impious lucre hold? Now, when my soul had shaken off her fears, I call my father and the Trojan peers, relate the prodigies of heaven, require what he commands, and their advice desire. All vote to leave that execrable shore, polluted with the blood of Polydor. But, ere we sail, his funeral rites prepare, then to his ghost a tomb and altars rear. 
In mournful pomp the matrons walk the round, With baleful cypress and blue fillets crowned, With eyes dejected and with hair unbound. Then bowls of tepid milk and blood we pour, And thrice invoke the soul of Polydore. Now, when the raging storms no longer reign, But southern gales invite us to the main, We launch our vessels with a prosperous wind, And leave the cities and the shores behind. An island in the Aegean main appears. Neptune and watery Doris claim it theirs. It floated once, till Phoebus fixed the sides to rooted earth, and now it braves the tides. Here, borne by friendly winds, we come ashore, with needful ease our weary limbs restore, and the sun's temple and his town adore. Aeneas, the priest and king with laurel crowned, his hoary locks with purple fillets bound, who saw my sire the Delian shore ascend, came forth with eager haste to meet his friend, invites him to his palace, and in sign of ancient love their plighted hands they join. Then to the temple of the god I went, and thus before the shrine my vows present. Give, O Thimbraeus, give a resting place to the sad relics of the Trojan race, a seat secure, a region of their own, a lasting empire and a happier town where shall we fix where shall our labours end whom shall we follow and what fate attend let not my prayers a doubtful answer find but in clear auguries unveil thy mind scarce had i said he shook the holy ground the laurels and the lofty hills around and from the tripos rushed a bellowing sound prostrate we fell confessed the present god who gave this answer from his dark abode. Undaunted youths, go seek that mother earth, from which your ancestors derive their birth. The soil that sent you forth, her ancient race, in her old bosom shall again embrace. Through the wide world the Aeneian house shall reign, and children's children shall the crown sustain. Thus Phoebus did our future fates disclose. A mighty tumult mixed with joy arose. All are concerned to know what place the god assigned and where determined our abode. My father, long revolving in his mind the race and lineage of the Trojan kind, thus answered their demands. Ye princes, hear your pleasing fortune and dispel your fear. The fruitful isle of Crete well known to fame, sacred of old to Jove's imperial name, in the mid-ocean lies with large command, and on its plains a hundred cities stand. Another Ida rises there, and we from thence derive our Trojan ancestry. From thence, as tis divulged by certain fame, to the Rhytian shores old Teucrus came. There fixed, and there the seat of empire chose, ere Ilium and the Trojan towers arose. In humble vales they built their soft abodes, till Sibylle, the mother of the gods, with tinkling cymbals charmed the Idaean woods. She secret rites and ceremonies taught, and to the yoke the savage lions brought. Let us the land which heaven appoints explore, appease the winds, and seek the Gnossian shore. If Jove assists the passage of our fleet, the third propitious dawn discovers Crete. Thus, having said, the sacrifices laid on smoking altars to the gods he paid. A bull to Neptune, an oblation due. Another bull to bright Apollo slew. A milk-white hue the western winds to please, and one coal-black to calm the stormy seas. Ere this, a flying rumour had been spread that fierce Sidomenius from Crete was fled expelled and exiled that the coast was free from foreign or domestic enemy we leave the delian ports and put to sea by noxos famed for vintage make our way then green donisa passed and sail in sight of paros isle with marble quarries white we pass the scattered isles of Cyclades, that scarce distinguished seem to stud the seas the shouts of sailors double near the shores, they stretch their canvas, and they ply their oars. All hands aloft, for Crete, for Crete, they cry, 
and swiftly through the foamy billows fly full on the promised land at length we bore with joy descending on the cretan shore with eager haste a rising town i frame which from the trojan pergamus i name the name itself was grateful i exhort to found their houses and erect a fort our ships are hauled upon the yellow strand the youth begin to till the labored land and i myself new marriages promote give laws and dwellings i divide by lot when rising vapors choke the wholesome air and blasts of noisome winds corrupt the year the trees devouring caterpillars burn parched was the grass and blighted was the corn nor scape the beasts for sirius from on high with pestilential heat infects the sky my men some fall the rest in fevers fry again my father bids me seek the shore of sacred delos and the god implore to learn what end of woes we might expect and to what clime our weary course direct twas night when every creature void of cares the common gift of balmy slumber shares the statues of my gods for such they seemed those gods whom i from flaming troy redeemed before me stood majestically bright full in the beams of phoebe's entering light then thus they spoke and eased my troubled mind what from the delian god thou goest to find he tells thee here and sends us to relate those powers are we companions of thy fate who from the burning town by thee were brought thy fortune followed and thy safety wrought through seas and lands as we thy steps attend so shall our care thy glorious race befriend an ample realm for thee thy fates ordain a town that o'er the conquered world shall reign thou mighty walls for mighty nations build nor let thy weary mind to labors yield but change thy seat for not the delian god nor we have given thee crete for our abode a land there is hesperia called of old the soil is fruitful and the natives bold the enotrians held it once by later fame now called italia from the leader's name iasius there and dardanus were born from thence we came and thither must return rise and thy sire with these glad tidings greet search italy for jove denies thee crete astonished at their voices and their sight nor were they dreams but visions of the night i saw i knew their faces and descried in perfect view their hair with fillets tied i started from my couch a clammy sweat on all my limbs and shivering body sat to heaven i lifted my hands with pious haste and sacred incense in the flames i cast thus to the gods their perfect honours done more cheerful to my good old sire i run and tell the pleasing news in little space he found his error of the double race not as before he deemed derived from crete no more deluded by the doubtful seat then said o son turmoiled in trojan fate such things as these cassandra did relate this day revives within my mind what she foretold of troy renewed in italy and latian lands but who could then have thought that phrygian gods to latium should be brought or who believed what mad cassandra taught now let us go where phoebus leads the way he said and we with glad consent obey forsake the seat and leaving few behind we spread our sails before the willing wind now from the sight of land our galleys move with only seas around and skies above when o'er our heads descends a burst of rain and night with sable clouds involves the main the ruffling winds the foamy billows raise the scattered fleet is forced to several ways the face of heaven is ravished from our eyes and in redoubled peals the roaring thunder flies cast from our course we wander in the dark no stars to guide no point of land to mark even palinurus no distinction found betwixt the night and day such darkness reigned around 
three starless nights the doubtful navy strays without distinction and three sunless days the fourth renews the light and from our shrouds we view a rising land like distant clouds the mountain tops confirm the pleasing sight and curling smoke ascending from their height the canvas falls their oars the sailors ply from the rude strokes the whirling waters fly at length i land upon the strophades safe from the danger of the stormy seas those isles are compassed by the ionian main the dire abode where the foul harpies reign forced by the winged warriors to repair to their old homes and leave their costly fare monsters more fierce offended heaven ne'er sent from hell's abyss for human punishment with virgin faces but with wombs obscene foul paunches and with order still unclean with claws for hands and looks for ever lean we landed at the port and soon beheld fat herds of oxen graze the flowery field and wanton goats without a keeper strayed with weapons we the welcome prey invade then call the gods for partners of our feast and jove himself the chief invited guest we spread the tables on the green sward ground we feed with hunger and the bowls go round when from the mountain tops with hideous cry and clattering wings the hungry harpies fly they snatch the meat defiling all they find and parting leave a loathsome stench behind close by a hollow rock again we sit new dress the dinner and the beds refit secure from sight beneath a pleasing shade where tufted trees a native arbor made again the holy fires on altars burn and once again the ravenous birds return or from the dark recesses where they lie or from another quarter of the sky with filthy claws their odious meal repeat and mix their loathsome orders with their meat i bid my friends for vengeance then prepare and with the hellish nation wage the war they as commanded for the fight provide and in the grass their glittering weapons hide then when along the crooked shore we hear their clattering wings and saw the foes appear misenus sounds a charge we take the alarm and our strong hands with swords and bucklers arm in this new kind of combat all employ their utmost force the monsters to destroy in vain the fated skin is proof to wounds and from their plumes the shining sword rebounds at length rebuffed they leave their mangled prey and their stretched pinions to the skies display yet one remained the messenger of fate high on a craggy cliff selino sat and thus her dismal errand did relate what not contented with our oxen slain dare you with heaven an impious war maintain and drive the harpies from their native reign heed therefore what i say and keep in mind what jove decrees what phoebus has designed and i the furies queen from both relate you seek the italian shores foredoomed by fate the italian shores are granted you to find and a safe passage to the port assigned but know that ere your promised walls you build my curses shall severely be fulfilled fierce famine is your lot for this misdeed reduced to grind the plates on which you feed she said and to the neighboring forest flew our courage fails us and our fears renew hopeless to win by war to prayers we fall and on the offended harpies humbly call and whether gods or birds obscene they were our vows for pardon and for peace prefer but old anchises offering sacrifice and lifting up to heaven his hands and eyes adored the greater gods avert said he these omens render vain this prophecy and from the impending curse a pious people free thus having said he bids us put to sea we loose from shore our halsers and obey and soon with swelling sails pursue the watery way amidst our course zacynthian woods appear 
and next by rocky Neritos we steer. We fly from Ithaca's detested shore, and curse the land which dire Ulysses bore. At length Leucate's cloudy top appears, and the sun's temple which the sailor fears, resolved to breathe a while from labor past, our crooked anchors from the prow we cast, and joyful to the little city haste. Here, safe beyond our hopes, our vows we pay to Jove, the guide and patron of our way. The customs of our country we pursue, and Trojan games on Actian shores renew. Our youth their naked limbs besmear with oil, and exercise the wrestler's noble toil. Pleased to have sailed so long before the wind, and left so many Grecian towns behind. The sun had now fulfilled his annual course, and Boreas on the seas displayed his force. I fixed upon the temple's lofty door the brazen shield which a vanquished Abbas bore. The verse beneath my name and action speaks, These arms Aeneas took from conquering Greeks. Then I command to weigh. The seamen ply their sweeping oars, the smoking billows fly. The sight of high Phaeacia soon we lost, and skimmed along Epirus' rocky coast. Then to Caonia's port our course we bend, and, landed, to Bothrotus' heights ascend. Here wondrous things were loudly blazed fame, how Helenus revived the Trojan name, and reigned in Greece, that Priam's captive son succeeded Pyrrhus in his bed and throne, and fair Andromache, restored by fate, once more was happy in a Trojan mate. I leave my galleys riding in the port, and long to see the new Dardanian court. By chance the mournful queen before the gate then solemnized her former husband's fate. Green altars raised of turf with gifts she crowned, and sacred priests in order stand around, and thrice the name of hapless Hector sound. The grove itself resembles Ida's wood, and Simois seemed the well-dissembled flood. But when at nearer distance she beheld my shining armor and my Trojan shield, astonished at the sight, the vital heat forsakes her limbs, her veins no longer beat. She faints, she falls, and scarce recovering strength, thus, with a faltering tongue, she speaks at length. Are you alive, O goddess-born, she said? Or, if a ghost, then where is Hector's shade? At this she cast a loud and frightful cry, With broken words I made this brief reply. All of me that remains appears in sight. I live, if living be to loathe the light. No phantom, but I drag a wretched life, My fate resembling that of Hector's wife. What have you suffered since you lost your lord? By what strange blessing are you now restored? Still are you Hector's? Or is Hector fled, and his remembrance lost in Pyrrhus' bed? With eyes dejected in a lowly tone, after a modest pause she thus begun. O only happy maid of Priam's race, whom death delivered from the foe's embrace, Commanded on Achilles' tomb to die, not forced like us to hard captivity, or in a haughty master's arms to lie. In Grecian ships unhappy we were born, endured the victor's lust, sustained the scorn. Thus I submitted to the lawless pride of Pyrrhus, more a handmaid than a bride. Cloyed with possession, he forsook my bed, and Helen's lovely daughter sought to wed. Then me to Trojan Helenus resigned, and his two slaves in equal marriage joined, till young Orestes, pierced with a deep despair, and longing to redeem the promised fair, before Apollo's altar slew the ravisher. By Pyrrhus' death the kingdom we regained, at least one half with Helenus remained. Our part from Caon he Caonia calls, and names from Pergamus his rising walls. But you what fates have landed on our coast? What gods have sent you, or what storms have tossed? Does young Ascanius life and health enjoy, saved from the ruins of unhappy Troy? 
O oh, tell me how his mother's loss he bears, What hopes are promised from his blooming years, How much of Hector in his face appears. She spoke, and mixed her speech with mournful cries, And fruitless tears came trickling from her eyes. At length her lord descends upon the plain, In pomp attended with a numerous train, Receives his friends, and to the city leads, and tears of joy amidst his welcome sheds. Proceeding on, another Troy I see, or in less compass, Troy's epitome. A rivlet by the name of Xanthus ran, and I embrace the Scaean gate again. My friends in porticos were entertained, and feasts and pleasures through the city reigned. The tables filled the spacious hall around, and golden bowls with sparkling wine were crowned. Two days we passed in mirth, till friendly gales, blown from the south, supplied our swelling sails. Then to the royal seer I thus began. O thou who knowest beyond the reach of man the laws of heaven, and what the stars decree, whom Phoebus taught unerring prophecy, from his own tripod and his holy tree, skilled in the winged inhabitants of air, what auspices their notes and flights declare, O oh, say, for all religious rites portend a happy voyage and a prosperous end, and every power and omen of the sky direct my course for destined Italy. But only dire Celino from the gods a dismal famine fatally forebodes. O oh, say what dangers I am first to shun, what toils vanquish, and what course to run. End of section 5《Section Six of the Aeneid of Virgil. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Three, Part Two. The prophet first, with sacrifice, adores the greater gods. Their pardon then implores, unbinds the fillet from his holy head. To Phoebus next, my trembling steps he led, full of religious doubts and awful dread. Then, with his god possessed before the shrine. These words proceeded from his mouth divine. O goddess born, for heaven's appointed will, With greater auspices of good than ill, For shows thy voyage and thy course directs, Thy fates conspire, and Jove himself protects. Of many things some few I shall explain, Teach thee to shun the dangers of the main, And how at length the promised shore to gain. The rest the fates from Helenus conceal, and Juno's angry power forbids to tell. First, then, that happy shore that seems so nigh will far from your deluded wishes fly. Long tracts of seas divide your hopes from Italy, for you must cruise along Sicilian shores and stem the currents with your struggling oars. Then round the Italian coast your navy steer, and after this to Circe's island veer and last before your new foundations rise must pass the stygian lake and view the nether skies now mark the signs of future ease and rest and bear them safely treasured in thy breast when in the shady shelter of a wood and near the margin of a gentle flood thou shalt behold a sow upon the ground with thirty sucking young encompassed round the dam and offspring white as falling snow, these on thy city shall their name bestow, and there shall end thy labors and thy woe. Nor let the threatened famine fright thy mind, for Phoebus will assist, and fate the way will find. Let not thy course to that ill coast be bent, which fronts from far the Epirian continent. Those parts are all by Grecian foes possessed, the savage Locrians here the shores infest. There fierce Idomeneus his city builds, And guards with arms the Salentinian fields, And on the mountain's brow Petilia stands, Which Philoctetes with his troops commands. Even when thy fleet is landed on the shore, And priests with holy vows the gods adore, Then with a purple veil involve your eyes, 
lest hostile faces blast the sacrifice these rites and customs to the rest commend that to your pious race they may descend when parted hence the wind that ready waits for sicily shall bear you to the straits where proud pelorus opes a wider way tack to the larboard and stand off to sea veer starboard sea and land the italian shore and fair sicilia's coast were one before an earthquake caused the flaw the roaring tides the passage broke that land from land divides and where the lands retired the rushing ocean rides distinguished by the straits on either hand now rising cities in long order stand and fruitful fields so much can time invade the mouldering work that beauteous nature made far on the right her dog's foul scylla hides charybdis roaring on the left presides and in her greedy whirlpool sucks the tides then spouts them from below with fury driven the waves mount up and wash the face of heaven but scylla from her din with open jaws the sinking vessel in her eddy draws then dashes on the rocks a human face and virgin bosom hides her tail's disgrace her parts obscene below the waves descend with dogs enclosed and in a dolphin end tis safer then to bear aloof to sea and coast pachinus though with more delay than once to view misshapen scylla near and the loud yell of watery wolves to hear besides if faith to helenus be due and if prophetic phoebus tell me true do not this precept of your friend forget which therefore more than once i must repeat above the rest great juno's name adore pay vows to juno juno's aid implore let gifts be to the mighty queen designed and mollify with prayers her haughty mind thus at the length your passage shall be free and you shall safe descend on italy arrived at cumae when you view the flood of black avernus and the sounding wood the mad prophetic sibyl you shall find dark in a cave and on a rock reclined she sings the fates and in her frantic fits the notes and names inscribed to leafs commits what she commits to leafs in order laid before the cavern's entrance are displayed unmoved they lie but if a blast of wind without or vapours issue from behind the leafs are borne aloft in liquid air and she resumes no more her museful care nor gathers from the rocks her scattered verse nor sets in order what the winds disperse thus many not succeeding most upbraid the madness of the visionary maid and with loud curses leave the mystic shade think it not loss of time a while to stay though thy companions chide thy long delay though summon to the seas though pleasing gales invite thy course and stretch thy swelling sails but beg the sacred priestess to relate with willing words and not to write thy fate the fierce italian people she will show and all thy wars and all thy future woe and what thou mayst avoid and what must undergo she shall direct thy course instruct thy mind and teach thee how the happy shores to find this is what heaven allows me to relate now part in peace pursue thy better fate and raise by strength of arms the trojan state this when the priest with friendly voice declared he gave me license and rich gifts prepared bounteous of treasure he supplied my want with heavy gold and polished elephant then doronean cauldrons put on board and every ship with sums of silver stored a trusty coat of mail to me he sent thrice chained with gold for use and ornament the helm of pyrrhus added to the rest that flourished with a plume and waving crest nor was my sire forgotten nor my friends 
and large recruits he to my navy sends men horses captains arms and warlike stores supplies new pilots and new sweeping oars meantime my sire commands to hoist our sails lest we should lose the first auspicious gales the prophet blessed the parting crew and last with words like these his ancient friend embraced old happy man the care of gods above whom heavenly venus honored with her love and twice preserved thy life when troy was lost behold from far the wished ausonian coast their land but take a larger compass round for that before is all forbidden ground the shore that phoebus has designed for you at farther distance lies concealed from view go happy hence and seek your new abodes blessed in a son and favored by the gods for i with useless words prolong your stay when southern gales have summoned you away nor less the queen our parting thence deplored nor was less bounteous than her trojan lord a noble present to my son she brought a robe with flowers on golden tissue wrought a phrygian vest and loads with gifts beside of precious texture and of asian pride except she said these monuments of love which in my youth with happier hands i wove regard these trifles for the giver's sake tis the last present hector's wife can make thou callest my lost astyanax to mind in thee his features and his form i find his eyes so sparkled with a lively flame such were his motions such was all his frame and ah had heaven so pleased his years had been the same with tears i took my last adieu and said your fortune happy pair already made leaves you no farther wish my different state avoiding one incurs another fate to you a quiet seat the gods allow you have no shores to search no seas to plough nor fields of flying italy to chase deluding visions and a vain embrace you see another simois and enjoy the labour of your hands another troy with better auspice than her ancient towers and less obnoxious to the grecian powers if e'er the gods whom i with vows adore conduct my steps to tiber's happy shore if ever i ascend the latian throne and build a city i may call my own as both of us our birth from troy derive so let our kindred lines in concord live and both in acts of equal friendship strive our fortunes good or bad shall be the same the double troy shall differ but in name that what we now begin may never end but long to late posterity descend near the caronian rocks our course we bore the shortest passage to the italian shore now had the sun withdrawn his radiant light and hills were hid in dusky shades of night we land and on the bosom of the ground a safe retreat and a bare lodging found close by the shore we lay the sailors keep their watches and the rest securely sleep the night proceeding on with silent pace stood in her noon and viewed with equal face her steepy rise and her declining race then wakeful palinurus rose to spy the face of heaven and the nocturnal sky and listened every breath of air to try observes the stars and notes their sliding course the pleiads hyads and their watery force and both the bears is careful to behold and bright orion armed with burnished gold then when he saw no threatening tempest nigh but a sure promise of a settled sky he gave the sign to weigh we break our sleep forsake the pleasing shore and plough the deep and now the rising morn with rosy light adorns the skies and puts the stars to flight when we from far like bluish mists descry the hills and then the plains of italy 
Achates first pronounced the joyful sound, then Italy the cheerful crew rebound. My sire and Caeses crowned a cup with wine, and offering thus implored the powers divine. Ye gods presiding over lands and seas, and you who raging winds and waves appease, breathe on our swelling sails a prosperous wind, and smooth our passage to the port assigned. The gentle gales their flagging force renew, and now the happy harbor is in view. Minerva's temple then salutes our sight, placed as a landmark on the mountain's height. We furl our sails and turn the prows to shore, the curling waters round the galleys roar. The land lies open to the raging east, then bending like a bow with rocks compressed, shuts out the storms, the winds and waves complain, and vent their malice on the cliffs in vain. The port lies hid within, on either side, two towering rocks, the narrow mouth divide. The temple which aloft we viewed before, to distance flies, and seems to shun the shore. Scarce landed, the first omens I beheld were four white steeds that cropped the flowery field. War, war is threatened from this foreign ground, my father cried, where warlike steeds are found. Yet since reclaimed to chariots they submit, and bend to stubborn yokes and champ the bit, peace may succeed to war. Our way we bend to palace, and the sacred hill ascend. There, prostrate to the fierce Virago pray, whose temple was the landmark of our way. Each with the Phrygian mantle veiled his head, and all commands of Helenus obeyed, and pious rites to Grecian Juno paid. These dues performed, we stretch our sails and stand to sea, forsaking that suspected land. From hence Tarantum's bay appears in view, for Hercules renowned if fame be true. Just opposite, Lacinian Juno stands, Caulonian towers and Scylacaean strands, for shipwrecks feared. Mount Etna thence we spy, known by the smoky flames which cloud the sky. Far off we hear the waves with surly sound invade the rocks, the rocks their groans rebound. The billows break upon the sounding strand, and roll the rising tide impure with sand. Then thus Anchises, in experience old, "'Tis that Charybdis which the seer foretold, and those the promised rocks, bear off to sea. With haste the frightened mariners obey. First Palinurus to the larboard veered, then all the fleet by his example steered. To heaven aloft on ridgy waves we ride, then down to hell descend when they divide. And thrice our galleys knocked the stony ground, and thrice the hollow rocks returned the sound, and thrice we saw the stars that stood with dews around. The flagging winds forsook us with the sun, and, wearied on Cyclopean shores, we run. The port capacious and secure from wind is to the foot of thundering Etna joined. By turns a pitchy cloud she rolls on high, by turns hot embers from her entrails fly, and flakes of mounting flames that lick the sky, off from her bowels massy rocks are thrown, and, shivered by the force, come piecemeal down. Oft liquid lakes of burning sulphur flow, fed from the fiery springs that boil below. In Celadus, they say, transfixed by Jove, with blasted limbs came tumbling from above, and where he fell the avenging father drew this flaming hill and on his body threw as often as he turns his weary sides he shakes the solid isle and smoke the heavens hides in shady woods we pass the tedious night where bellowing sounds and groans our souls affright of which no cause is offered to the sight for not one star was kindled in the sky nor could the moon her borrowed light supply. For misty clouds involved the firmament, the stars were muffled, and the moon was pent. Scarce had the rising sun the day revealed, 
scarce had his heat the pearly dews dispelled when from the woods their bolts before our sight somewhat betwixt a mortal and a sprite so thin so ghastly meagre and so wan so bare of flesh he scarce resembled man this thing all tattered seemed from far to implore our pious aid and pointed to the shore we look behind then view his shaggy beard his clothes were tagged with thorns and filth his limbs besmeared the rest in mien in habit and in face appeared a greek and such indeed he was he cast on us from far a frightful view whom soon for trojans and for foes he knew stood still and paused then all at once began to stretch his limbs and trembled as he ran soon as approached upon his knees he falls and thus with tears and sighs for pity calls now by the powers above and what we share from nature's common gift this vital air o trojans take me hence i beg no more but bear me far from this unhappy shore tis true i am a greek and farther own among your foes besieged the imperial town for such demerits if my death be due no more for this abandoned life i sue this only favour let my tears obtain to throw me headlong in the rapid main since nothing more than death my crime demands i die content to die by human hands he said and on his knees my knees embraced i bade him boldly tell his fortune past his present state his lineage and his name the occasion of his fears and whence he came the good anchises raised him with his hand who thus encouraged answered our demand from ithaca my native soil i came to troy and Achaemenides, my name me my poor father with ulysses sent oh had i stayed with poverty content but fearful for themselves my countrymen left me forsaken in the cyclops din the cave though large was dark the dismal floor was paved with mangled limbs and putrid gore our monstrous host of more than human size erects his head and stares within the skies bellowing his voice and horrid is his hue ye gods remove this plague from mortal view the joints of slaughtered wretches are his food and for his wine he quaffs the streaming blood these eyes beheld when with his spacious hand he seized two captives of our grecian band stretched on his back he dashed against the stones their broken bodies and their crackling bones with spouting blood the purple pavement swims while the dire glutton grinds the trembling limbs not unrevenged ulysses bore their fate nor thoughtless of his own unhappy state for gorged with flesh and drunk with human wine while fast asleep the giant lay supine snoring aloud and belching from his maw his indigested foam and morsels raw we pray we cast the lots and then surround the monstrous body stretched along the ground each as he could approach him lends a hand to bore his eyeball with a flaming brand beneath his frowning forehead lay his eye for only one did the vast frame supply but that a globe so large his front it filled like the sun's disk or like a grecian shield the stroke succeeds and down the pupil bends this vengeance followed for our slaughtered friends but haste unhappy wretches haste to fly your cables cut and on your oars rely such and so vast as polypheme appears a hundred more this hated island bears like him in caves they shut their woolly sheep like him their herds on tops of mountains keep like him with mighty strides they stalk from steep to steep and now three moons their sharpened horns renew since thus in woods and wilds obscure from view i drag my loathsome days with mortal fright and in deserted caverns lodge by night oft from the rocks a dreadful prospect see of the huge cyclops like a walking tree from far i hear his thundering voice resound and trampling feet that shake the solid ground cornels and savage berries of the wood and roots and herbs have been my meagre food 
while all around my longing eyes I cast, I saw your happy ships appear at last. On those I fixed my hopes, to these I run, tis all I ask this cruel race to shun. What other death you please yourselves bestow. Scarce had he said, when on the mountain's brow we saw the giant shepherd stalk before his following flock, and leading to the shore a monstrous bulk, deformed, deprived of sight, his staff a trunk of pine to guide his steps aright. His ponderous whistle from his neck descends, his woolly care their pensive lord attends. This only solace his hard fortune sends. Soon as he reached the shore and touched the waves, from his bored eye the guttering blood he laves. He gnashed his teeth and groaned, through seas he strides, and scarce the topmost billows touched his sides. Seized with a sudden fear, we run to sea, the cables cut and silent haste away, the well-deserving stranger entertain. Then, buckling to the work, our oars divide the main. The giant hearkened to the dashing sound, but when our vessels out of reach he found, he strided onward and in vain essayed the Ionian deep and durst no farther wade. With that he roared aloud, the dreadful cry shakes earth and air and seas, the billows fly before the bellowing noise to distant Italy, the nearing Etna trembling all around, the winding caverns echo to the sound. His brother Cyclops hear the yelling roar, and rushing down the mountains crowd the shore. We saw their stern distorted looks from far, and one-eyed glance that vainly threatened war. A dreadful council with their heads on high, the misty clouds about their foreheads fly, not yielding to the towering tree of Jove, or tallest cypress of Diana's grove. New pangs of mortal fear our minds assail. We tug at every oar and hoist up every sail, and take the advantage of the friendly gale. For warned by Helenus, we strive to shun Charybdis' gulf, nor dare to Scylla run. An equal fate on either side appears. We, tacking to the left, are free from fears. For from Pelorus' point the north arose, and drove us back where swift Pantagius flows. His rocky mouth we pass and make our way by Thapsus and Megara's winding bay. This passage Achaemenides had shown, tracing the course which he before had run. Right o'er against Plemirium's watery strand, there lies an isle once called the Ortygian land. Alpheus, as old fame reports, has found from Greece a secret passage underground. By love to beauteous Arethusa led, and, mingling here, they roll in the same sacred bed. As Helenus enjoined, we next adore Diana's name, protectress of the shore. With prosperous gales we pass the quiet sounds of still Elorus and his fruitful bounds. Then, doubling Cape Pachinus, we survey the rocky shore extended to the sea, the town of Camarine from far we see, and Fenny Lake, undrained by fate's decree, in sight of the Geloan fields we pass, and the large walls where mighty Gela was. Then Agragas, with lofty summits crowned, long for the race of warlike steeds renowned. We passed Selinus and the palmy land, and widely shun the Lilibaean strand, unsafe for secret rocks and moving sand. At length on shore the weary fleet arrived, which Trepanum's unhappy port received. Here, after endless labors often tossed by raging storms and driven on every coast, my dear, dear father, spent with age, I lost, ease of my cares and solace of my pain. Saved through a thousand toils, but saved in vain. The prophet, who my future woes revealed, Yet this the greatest and the worst concealed. And dire Celino, whose foreboding skill Denounced all else, was silent of the ill. This my last labor was. Some friendly god from thence conveyed us To your blessed abode. Thus to the listening queen, the royal guest, 
his wandering course and all his toils expressed and here concluding he retired to rest end of section six section seven of the aeneid of virgil this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. The Aeneid of Virgil, translated by John Dryden, Book Four, Part One. But anxious cares already seized the queen. She fed within her veins a flame unseen. The hero's valor, acts, and birth inspire her soul with love and fan the secret fire. His words, his looks, imprinted in her heart, Improve the passion and increase the smart. Now, when the purple morn had chased away The dewy shadows and restored the day, Her sister first with early care she sought, And thus in mournful accents eased her thought. My dearest Anna, what new dreams affright my laboring soul, what visions of the night disturb my quiet and distract my breast with strange ideas of our trojan guest his worth his actions and majestic air a man descended from the gods declare fear ever argues a degenerate kind his birth is well asserted by his mind then what he suffered when by fate betrayed what brave attempts for falling Troy he made! Such were his looks, so gracefully he spoke, That were I not resolved against the yoke Of hapless marriage never to be cursed with second love, So fatal was my first, to this one error I might yield again. For since Sichaeus was untimely slain, This only man is able to subvert the fixed foundations of my stubborn heart and to confess my frailty to my shame somewhat i find within if not the same too like the sparkles of my former flame but first let yawning earth a passage rend and let me through the dark abyss descend first let avenging jove with flames from high drive down this body to the nether sky condemned with ghosts and endless night to lie before I break the plighted faith I gave. No, he who had my vows shall ever have. For whom I loved on earth, I worship in the grave. She said, the tears ran gushing from her eyes, and stopped her speech. Her sister thus replies, O oh, dearer than the vital air I breathe, will you to grief your blooming years bequeath? condemned to waste in woes your lonely life without the joys of mother or of wife think you these tears this pompous train of woe are known or valued by the ghosts below i grant that while your sorrows yet were green it well became a woman and a queen the vows of tyrian princes to neglect to scorn hyarbas and his love reject with all the Libyan lords of mighty name. But will you fight against a pleasing flame? This little spot of land which heaven bestows on every side is hemmed with warlike foes. Gatulian cities here are spread around, and fierce Numidians there your frontiers bound. Here lies a barren waste of thirsty land, and there the Syrtes raise the moving sand. Barcaean troops besiege the narrow shore, and from the sea Pygmalion threatens more. Propitious heaven and gracious Juno lead this wandering navy to your needful aid. How will your empire spread, your city rise from such a union and with such allies? Implore the favor of the powers above, and leave the conduct of the rest to love continue still your hospitable way and still invent occasions of their stay till storms and winter winds shall cease to threat 
and planks and oars repair their shattered fleet these words which from a friend and sister came with ease resolved the scruples of her fame and added fury to the kindled flame inspired with hope the project they pursue on every altar sacrifice renew a chosen ewe of two years old they pay to ceres bacchus and the god of day preferring juno's power for juno ties the nuptial knot and makes the marriage joys the beauteous queen before her altar stands and holds the golden goblet in her hands a milk-white heifer she with flowers adorns and pours the ruddy wine betwixt her horns and while the priests with prayer the gods invoke she feeds their altars with sabaean smoke with hourly care the sacrifice renews and anxiously the panting entrails views what priestly rites alas what pious art what vows avail to cure a bleeding heart a gentle fire she feeds within her veins where the soft god secure in silence reigns sick with desire and seeking him she loves from street to street the raving dido roves so when the watchful shepherd from the blind wounds with a random shaft the careless hind distracted with her pain she flies the woods bounds o'er the lawn and seeks the silent floods with fruitless care for still the fatal dart sticks in her side and rankles in her heart and now she leads the trojan chief along the lofty walls amidst the busy throng displays her tyrian wealth and rising town which love without his labor makes his own this pomp she shows to tempt her wandering guest her faltering tongue forbids to speak the rest when day declines and feasts renew the night still on his face she feeds her famished sight she longs again to hear the prince relate his own adventures and the trojan fate he tells it o'er and o'er but still in vain for still she begs to hear it once again the hearer on the speaker's mouth depends and thus the tragic story never ends then when they part when phoebe's paler light withdraws and falling stars to sleep invite she last remains when every guest is gone sits on the bed he pressed and sighs alone absent her absent hero sees and hears or in her bosom young ascanius bears and seeks the father's image in the child if love by likeness might be so beguiled meantime the rising towers are at a stand no labors exercise the youthful band nor use of arts nor toils of arms they know the mole is left unfinished to the foe the mounds the works the walls neglected lie short of their promised height that seemed to threat the sky but when imperial juno from above saw dido fettered in the chains of love hot with the venom which her veins inflamed and by no sense of shame to be reclaimed with soothing words to venus she begun high praises endless honors you have won and mighty trophies with your worthy son two gods a silly woman hath undone nor am i ignorant you both suspect this rising city which my hands erect but shall celestial discord never cease tis better ended in a lasting peace you stand possessed of all your soul desired poor dido with consuming love is fired your trojan with my tyrian let us join so dido shall be yours aeneas mine one common kingdom one united line eliza shall a darden lord obey and lofty carthage for a dower convey then venus who her hidden fraud descried which would the sceptre of the world misguide to libyan shores thus artfully replied who but a fool would wars with juno choose and such alliance and such gifts refuse if fortune with our joint desires comply the doubt is all from jove and destiny lest he forbid with absolute command 
to mix the people in one common land or will the trojan and the tyrian line in lasting leagues and sure succession join but you the partner of his bed and throne may move his mind my wishes are your own mine said imperial juno be the care time urges now to perfect this affair attend my counsel and the secret share when next the sun his rising light displays and gilds the world below with purple rays the queen aeneas and the tyrian court shall to the shady woods for sylvan game resort there while the huntsmen pitch their toils around and cheerful horns from side to side resound a pitchy cloud shall cover all the plain with hail and thunder and tempestuous rain the fearful train shall take their speedy flight dispersed and all involved in gloomy night one cave a grateful shelter shall afford to the fair princess and the trojan lord i will myself the bridal bed prepare if you to bless the nuptials will be there so shall their loves be crowned with due delights and hymen shall be present at the rites the queen of love consents and closely smiles at her vain project and discovered wiles the rosy morn was risen from the main and horns and hounds awake the princely train they issue early through the city gate where the more wakeful huntsmen ready wait with nets and toils and darts beside the force of spartan dogs and swift massilian horse the tyrian peers and officers of state for the slow queen in antechambers wait her lofty courser in the court below who his majestic rider seems to know proud of his purple trappings paws the ground and champs the golden bit and spreads the foam around the queen at length appears on either hand the brawny guards in martial order stand a flowered simar with golden fringe she wore and at her back a golden quiver bore her flowing hair a golden cowl restrains a golden clasp the tyrian robe sustains then young ascanius with a sprightly grace leads on the trojan youth to view the chase but far above the rest in beauty shines the great aeneas the troop he joins like fair apollo when he leaves the frost of wintry xanthus and the lycian coast when to his native delos he resorts ordains the dances and renews the sports where painted scythians mixed with cretan bands before the joyful altars join their hands himself on kynthos walking sees below the merry madness of the sacred show green wreaths of bays his length of hair enclose a golden fillet binds his awful brows his quiver sounds not less the prince is seen in manly presence or in lofty mien now had they reached the hills and stormed the seat of savage beasts in dens their last retreat the cry pursues the mountain goats they bound from rock to rock and keep the craggy ground quite otherwise the stags a trembling train in herds unsingled scour the dusty plain and a long chase in open view maintain the glad ascanius as his courser guides spurs through the vale and these and those outrides his horse's flanks and sides are forced to feel the clanking lash and goring of the steel impatiently he views the feeble prey wishing some nobler beast to cross his way and rather would the tusky boar attend or see the tawny lion downward bend meantime the gathering clouds obscure the skies from pole to pole the forky lightning flies the rattling thunders roll and juno pours a wintry deluge down and sounding showers the company dispersed to converts ride and seek the homely cots or mountains hollow side the rapid rains descending from the hills to rolling torrents raise the creeping rills the queen and prince as love or fortune guides one common cavern in her bosom hides then first the trembling earth the signal gave and flashing fires enlighten all the cave 
Hell from below, and Juno from above, And howling nymphs were conscious of their love. From this ill-omened hour in time arose Debate and death, and all succeeding woes. The queen, whom sense of honor could not move, No longer made a secret of her love, But called it marriage, by that specious name, To veil the crime, and sanctify the shame. The loud report through Libyan cities goes, Fame the great ill from small beginnings grows. Swift from the first, and every moment brings New vigor to her flights, new pinions to her wings. Soon grows the pygmy to gigantic size, Her feet on earth, her forehead in the skies. Enraged against the gods, revengeful earth Produced her last of the Titanian birth. Swift is her walk, more swift her winged haste, a monstrous phantom, horrible and vast, as many plumes as raise her lofty flight, so many piercing eyes enlarge her sight. Millions of opening mouths to fame belong, and every mouth is furnished with a tongue, and round with listening ears the flying plague is hung. She fills the peaceful universe with cries, no slumbers ever close her wakeful eyes, by day from lofty towers her head she shows and spreads through trembling crowds disastrous news with court informers haunts and royal spies things done relates not done she feigns and mingles truth with lies talk is her business and her chief delight to tell of prodigies and cause of fright she fills the people's ears with dido's name who, lost to honor and the sense of shame, admits into her throne and nuptial bed a wandering guest who from his country fled. Whole days with him she passes in delights, and wastes in luxury long winter nights, forgetful of her fame and royal trust, dissolved in ease, abandoned to her lust. The goddess widely spreads the loud report, and flies at length to King Hyarba's court. When first possessed with this unwelcome news, whom did he not of men and gods accuse? This prince, from ravished Garamantus born, a hundred temples did with spoils adorn in Amon's honor his celestial sire, a hundred altars fed with wakeful fire, and through his vast dominions priests ordained, whose watchful care these holy rites maintained the gates and columns were with garlands crowned and blood of victim beasts enriched the ground he when he heard a fugitive could move the tyrian princess who disdained his love his breast with fury burned his eyes with fire mad with despair impatient with desire then on the sacred altars pouring wine he thus with prayers implored his sire divine great jove propitious to the moorish race who feast on painted beds with offerings grace thy temples and adore thy power divine with blood of victims and with sparkling wine seest thou not this or do we fear in vain thy boasted thunder and thy thoughtless reign? Do thy broad hands the forky lightnings lance? Thine are the bolts, or the blind work of chance? A wandering woman builds within our state a little town bought at an easy rate. She pays me homage, and my grants allow a narrow space of Libyan lands to plough. Yet scorning me by passion blindly led, Admits a banished Trojan to her bed. And now this other Paris, with his train Of conquered cowards, must in Afric reign, Whom what they are their looks and garb confess, Their locks with oil perfumed their Lydian dress. He takes the spoil, enjoys the princely dame, and I, rejected I, adore an empty name. His vows in haughty terms he thus preferred, And held his altar's horns. The mighty thunderer heard, 
then cast his eyes on carthage where he found the lustful pair in lawless pleasure drowned lost in their loves insensible of shame and both forgetful of their better fame he calls Cyllenius, and the god attends by whom his menacing command he sends go mount the western winds and cleave the sky then with a swift descent to carthage fly there find the trojan chief who wastes his days in slothful riot and in glorious ease nor minds the future city given by fate to him this message from my mouth relate not so fair venus hoped when twice she won thy life with prayers nor promised such a son hers was a hero destined to command a martial race and rule the latian land who should his ancient line from teucer draw and on the conquered world impose the law if glory cannot move a mind so mean nor future praise from fading pleasure wean yet why should he defraud his son of fame and grudge the romans their immortal name what are his vain designs what hopes he more from his long lingering on a hostile shore regardless to redeem his honor lost and for his race to gain the ausonian coast bid him with speed the tyrian court forsake with this command the slumbering warrior wake hermes obeys with golden pinions binds his flying feet and mounts the western winds and whether o'er the seas or earth he flies with rapid force they bear him down the skies but first he grasps within his awful hand the mark of sovereign power his magic wand with this he draws the ghosts from hollow graves with this he drives them down the stygian waves with this he seals in sleep the wakeful sight and eyes though closed in death restores to light thus armed the god begins his airy race and drives the racking clouds along the liquid space now sees the tops of atlas as he flies whose brawny back supports the starry skies atlas whose head with piny forests crowned is beaten by the winds with foggy vapors bound snows hide his shoulders from beneath his chin the founts of rolling streams their race begin a beard of ice on his large breast depends here poised upon his wings the god descends then rested thus he from the towering height plunged downward with precipitated flight lights on the seas and skims along the flood as waterfowl who seek their fishy food less and yet less to distant prospect show by turns they dance aloft and dive below like these the steerage of his wings he plies and near the surface of the water flies till having passed the seas and crossed the sands he closed his wings and stooped on libyan lands where shepherds once were housed in homely sheds now towers within the clouds advance their heads arriving there he found the trojan prince new ramparts raising for the town's defence a purple scarf with gold embroidered o'er queen dido's gift about his waist he wore a sword with glittering gems diversified for ornament not use hung idly by his side then thus with winged words the god began resuming his own shape degenerate man thou woman's property what mix'st thou here these foreign walls and tyrian towers to rear forgetful of thy own all-powerful jove who sways the world below and heaven above has sent me down with this severe command what means thy lingering in the libyan land if glory cannot move a mind so mean nor future praise from flitting pleasure wean regard the fortunes of thy rising heir the promised crown let young ascanius wear to whom the ausonian sceptre and the state of rome's imperial name is owed by fate so spoke the god and speaking took his flight involved in clouds and vanished out of sight the pious prince was seized with sudden fear 
mute was his tongue, and upright stood his hair. Revolving in his mind the stern command, he longs to fly, and loathes the charming land. What should he say, or how should he begin? What course, alas, remains to steer between the offended lover and the powerful queen? This way and that he turns his anxious mind, and all expedience tries, and none can find. Fixed on the deed, but doubtful of the means, after long thought to this advice he leans. Three chiefs he calls, commands them to repair the fleet, and ship their men with silent care. Some plausible pretense he bids them find, to colour what in secret he designed. Himself, meantime, the softest hours would choose, before the lovesick lady heard the news, and move her tender mind by slow degrees to suffer what the sovereign power decrees. Jove will inspire him when and what to say. They hear with pleasure and with haste obey. But soon the queen perceives the thin disguise. What arts can blind a jealous woman's eyes? She was the first to find the secret fraud before the fatal news was blazed abroad love the first motions of the lover hears quick to presage and even in safety fears nor impious fame was wanting to report the ships repaired the trojans thick resort and purpose to forsake the tyrian court frantic with fear impatient of the wound and impotent of mind she roves the city round less wild the bacchanalian dames appear when from afar their nightly god they hear and howl about the hills and shake the wreathy spear at length she finds the dear perfidious man prevents his formed excuse and thus began base and ungrateful could you hope to fly and undiscovered scape a lover's eye nor could my kindness your compassion move nor plighted vows nor dearer bands of love or is the death of a despairing queen not worth preventing though too well foreseen even when the wintry winds command your stay you dare the tempests and defy the sea false as you are suppose you were not bound to lands unknown and foreign coasts to sound were troy restored and priam's happy reign now durst you tempt for troy the raging main see whom you fly am i the foe you shun now by those holy vows so late begun by this right hand since i have nothing more to challenge but the faith you gave before i beg you by these tears too truly shed by the new pleasures of our nuptial bed if ever dido when you most were kind were pleasing in your eyes or touched your mind by these my prayers if prayers may yet have place pity the fortunes of a falling race for you i have provoked a tyrant's hate incensed the libyan and the tyrian state for you alone i suffer in my fame bereft of honour and exposed to shame whom have i now to trust ungrateful guest that only name remains of all the rest what have i left or whither can i fly must i attend pygmalion's cruelty or till hyarba shall in triumph lead a queen that proudly scorned his proffered bed had you deferred at least your hasty flight and left behind some pledge of our delight some babe to bless the mother's mournful sight some young aeneas to supply your place whose features might express his father's face i should not then complain to live bereft of all my husband or be wholly left here paused the queen unmoved he holds his eyes by jove's command nor suffered love to rise though heaving in his heart and thus at length replies fair queen you never can enough repeat your boundless favours or i own my debt nor can my mind forget eliza's name while vital breath inspires this mortal frame this only let me speak in my defence i never hoped a secret flight from hence much less pretended 
to the lawful claim of sacred nuptials or a husband's name for if indulgent heaven would leave me free and not submit my life to fate's decree my choice would lead me to the trojan shore those relics to review their dust adore and priam's ruined palace to restore but now the delphian oracle commands and fate invites me to the latian lands that is the promised place to which i steer and all my vows are terminated there if you a tyrian and a stranger born with walls and towers a libyan town adorn why may not we like you a foreign race like you seek shelter in a foreign place as often as the night obscures the skies with humid shades or twinkling stars arise and Caeses' angry ghost in dreams appears chides my delay and fills my soul with fears and young ascanius justly may complain of his defrauded and destined reign even now the herald of the gods appeared waking i saw him and his message heard from jove he came commissioned heavenly bright with radiant beams and manifest to sight the sender and the scent i both attest these walls he entered and those words expressed fair queen oppose not what the gods command forced by my fate i leave your happy land end of section seven